Okay, guys, lab safety discussion. I know you've been so excited and you're just waiting for this, but it is really, really, really important. So we are gonna talk about it. When you get to lab the very first day, oh wow, I reflect a lot when the screen is white. <laughs> when you get to lab, you're gonna see a safety contract. It's gonna be carbonless copy pages. So they'll be uh, white, yellow, and pink. Um, one of them is for you, one of them is for the lab, and one of them goes to um, my boss, basically. Okay, so what this says is that you understand the safety requirements for the chemistry lab. Honestly, the chemistry lab is potentially one of the most dangerous places on campus. So we have to be sure that everybody is following the same rules, and um, this is one of the ways we do it. The other way is that you are going to watch the safety video before you do anything in lab. Um, and so what you're doing when you sign this page is agreeing to follow these rules and agreeing to follow the safety video that you watch from, from Flynn. Okay. So I'm not going to read this to you, but I am going to discuss each point. So the first thing is that you have to have goggles. Okay. We don't allow the use of, um, the sunglasses style of eye protection because that does not protect you from splashes in all directions. Those are actually meant for construction situations where you might need to be protected, pr protected from projectiles. They're not chemical um, safe. So you need the kind that kind of like go all the way around your face. They make you look like a raccoon after lab. It's very stylish. At least I guess because that's what I looked like when I met my husband and we're still together. So. If you don't have goggles of your own, we have some loaners that you can use and some alcohol to clean them. If, um, if you come in partway through lab and you don't have any goggles, there are some hanging by the entrance to the lab, please use them. They are cleaned before they get put back. The second thing um, is that in addition to the goggles, anyone in the lab during, during chemical use needs to have the goggles on. Um, me, you, our technician, everyone. If you're actually doing chemistry, you also need to have a lab apron, which is not the same thing as a kitchen apron. Okay, a lab apron is plastic. Uh, I advise writing front on the front of it so that next time you come, you're not putting any potential chemicals against your clothing. Uh, but that's the cheapest option. You can get them at the bookstore. And we have a few to loan if you'd like. Um, the second option is a lab coat. And so lab coats are not just cotton. They're cotton, but they're coated with some hydrophobic material so that it sort of repels water a little bit to give you a little bit of extra time to get out um, before the chemicals soak through. So either one of those is fine. We do have loaners for both. Um, you also need to have disposable gloves. Uh, for summer 2020, we actually do have some disposable gloves. Somebody donated a case, uh, two cases to us. Um, so if you can't find them anywhere, don't sweat it. We have some large and some medium gloves. If you have small hands, you might want to try to find some small somewhere. It may be a challenge right now, I know, but um, pharmacies have them in the first aid section, and Walmart sometimes has it in the first aid or the paint section. Lowe's, BJ's used to carry them, so stuff like that. Um, in our case, you will be using gloves, goggles, and a lab coat or lab apron every single lab period, so you should plan for that. You can leave your PPE in a drawer. It will be assigned to you by number based on where you stand in the hallway. Um, but that drawer is yours for the entire term. It gets locked in the, at the end and you know, it's fine. If you have long hair, I actually have pretty long hair, but you probably won't ever see it because I'm a chemist. And the reason I still have long hair is that I never wear it down. <laughs> if you wear it down, it has a tendency to get dipped in chemicals or caught on fire or stuck in a centrifuge. That's really bad. Um, so wear your hair up. If you have really long hair like I do, a ponytail might not cut it. So the test is if you put your hair up and you lean forward, if anything comes forward around your face, then you need to put it up more, a bun or something like that. If you forget one day, I do have some hair ties in the lab because I forget too. Um, but you have to come up front to get that. Um, you can't wear flammable clothing. 
okay, so this is a bit tricky. So what I generally tell people is it's a good idea to wear natural fabrics because natural fabrics tend to be flame resistant, things like cotton. Wool is completely flame proof. Um, might not work out in the summer, but it is. Uh, things like polyester are not so great to wear because if they get chemicals on them, they can literally dissolve on your skin. Um, if they catch on fire, they'll melt into your skin like napalm. So try to avoid that kind of thing. Simple natural fibers are better. Um, you also don't want to wear anything flammable like hairspray, perfume, any of that stuff. Um, and acrylic nails are very, very flammable. I've seen this myself. So you can't have those in the lab. I'm sorry if you just got your nails done, but um, it's for your safety. And the gloves don't block it. They still catch on fire. So You also must have closed toed shoes. You got to actually have shoes that completely cover your feet. The reason for that is if something drops, whether it's you or your neighbor or whatever, your entire foot needs to be protected because that is one of the most vulnerable areas in the lab. Um, don't wear super expensive shoes to the lab either. I had somebody wear Uggs once and she spilled acid on them and eventually they dissolved in little holes all over it. Um, so the purpose of the shoes is to give you a few seconds to get get them off of you before the, the uh, material leaks through to your skin. And in Gen Chem 2 in particular, we don't want these things leaking into your skin. These are heavy metals. They're, they can be toxic at high enough doses and, and they're usually, I think they're always actually made in nitric acid, which is damaging to the skin too. So cover your whole foot. Things like Crocs are not allowed, ballet slippers don't cover your foot, um, sandals probably not going to work, right? So the best test is to go stand in a mud puddle. If your uh, if your foot does not get wet for a couple seconds, that's a good lab shoe. You might also ruin your shoe though. <laughs> okay. If you can, slip resistant shoes are great. Certainly no high heels though, or anything that are prone to slipping because we have concrete floors. Um, when you come into lab, you're going to leave your backpack and extra materials at the door. There's hooks, or you can leave them in cubbies. Same with any water that you might bring with you or snacks. Um, the only thing you want to bring with you is your lab notebook, your lab textbook, and a pen or a pencil. That's all you need. Okay. When you put things on the hooks or in the cubbies, that means nothing needs not on the ground. You want to leave the walkways open so we can evacuate if we have to and don't block any of the big gray electrical panels. We cannot have stools or chairs in the lab stations because of uh, liability. We need to be able to evacuate um, and stools block the walkway. If you have a medical condition that means you can't stand for a very long period of time, we can accommodate that. We have special, very comfortable chairs, but you have to go to the Office of Accessibility Resources in order to get the note that says we can accommodate that. It isn't a problem, I just need the paperwork. Okay, no food or drinks beyond the, the sort of black and yellow tape that we have on the floor at the entrance. That's for your safety. The labs, um, you should assume all lab benches are contaminated. Even if you've cleaned them, the heavy metals don't wash out very well. They're not very soluble. So those benches have been there for 30 plus years and you probably don't wanna eat that. I hope. You need to clean your workspace before you leave. So in the age of COVID, we have an extra step. So generally what you're going to do is put away your glassware. Hopefully you're cleaning it unless you're still in the middle of an experiment. Um, so that goes back in your drawer generally or on the side where, you know, in, on the pile where you got it. And you're going to spray soapy water all over your bench anywhere you worked and use a squeegee to drag that into the sink. Then the last step is to spray it, spray it down with an alcohol bottle, that is to sterilize it. So spray the bench and spray the drawers. That way we know that it's clean for the next people. I am very strict about cleanliness. I have been told by our techs that my classes are the cleanest and that's probably because I take off points if classes continue to leave messes. It's really easy to know who's doing it because you guys are all going to be at your stations and it's assigned for the entire semester. So make sure you're not leaving any paper or sticks in the sink from lighting fires. Make sure you're putting everything away. Okay. 
So, um, cell phones are not allowed in the lab, not because I'm worried about you getting answers. That's the point of the thing is to get answers. Not because I'm worried about you being distracted, but because it, it is a chemical hazard. So if you pick up your phone, say you need to time something and you're like, oh, I'll just use my phone. The problem with that is whatever is on your gloves is now on your phone. And the next time that you answer the phone is going to be on your face. I have seen people who came back from um, Gen Chem 2 lab. A week later, they had a yellow and black blister roughly in the shape of a cell phone on their face. And I was like, hmm, what happened? I already knew, but you know, I had to ask. And they were like, well, Professor Miller, I didn't listen to you and I used my phone in lab last week and then this happened. And I said, yeah, that's a nitric acid blister. That sucks. It's gonna take like six weeks to heal. And then he had to go on a date the next week, so that was awkward. Anyway, it's not a good idea to use your cell phone in the lab. We have a clock at the front of the room and we have stopwatches if you really need it. The only time you actually need it in this class is for the kinetics experiment. Every other time, the call scheme, those times are approximate. You're actually looking for the characteristic that the book says. For example, if it says, until no solid remains, then just keep heating it until there's no solid. So like that. All right. If uh, you have your cell phone out, I will ask you nicely one time. And then I just take it away and put it up to the front of the room. And that's embarrassing because everybody sees me do it. So leave your cell phone in your pocket or your backpack. If you have an emergency situation where you're expecting a phone call that's important, let me know that and you can leave it up front with me. And if you get the call that you're expecting, I can answer it and tell the people to wait for you. Okay. Um, when you take your call, it needs to be out in the hallway so you can take off your PPE to handle your phone. If you need to leave the room, let me know. That's particularly important because there's only certain places that you guys can walk without um, breaking our six foot distance. Um, so be careful, but also I need to know where you are in case of evacuation. If you're done for the day, let me know that. If you're going to the bathroom, let me know that. I gotta know where you are. Um, you can't do things unless you ask me. So some, you know, the procedures um, may inspire you to wonder what would happen if you mixed a couple of other things together. Uh, I'm just as curious as the next person, maybe more. I think that's what makes people good at science, but you have to ask before you do it. These chemicals are dangerous and I probably know what will happen. And if it's safe enough, I'll let you do it. If it's not, I'll tell you you can't do it or I'll do it myself because I don't know what happens, one or the other. You'll see when you get into the lab that we have a separate prep room. Generally speaking, unless authorized specifically by me or our technician, whose name is Kate, you can't go in there. That's where we store our bulk chemicals. And if you are in there, be careful um, and clean up your mess. You can't take anything out of the lab. Nothing we make, nothing we use. It all has to stay in the lab. This is actually a Department of Homeland Security issue. I have to report anything that goes missing, so don't. Um, our chemical waste needs to be put in the right spots. We try to make it really, really clear. But if you have any question whatsoever, please ask before you dump it. In general, only acids and bases can go in the sink. Everything else needs to go in special waste containers. If you have any kind of accident, whether it's a little teeny minor burn or it's a little cut or whatever it is, you need to, ask, you need to let me know. We need to write down what you were doing in case later on you find um, an allergic reaction or you find blisters on your face, et cetera. Okay, so we just document what you were doing and what happened and any measures we used to fix it. Finally, never work alone in the laboratory. This is not a problem because the doors are locked until I let you in. All right, so you're going to sign this. You're going to date it, you're going to write your name, and then we're going to write on here. Um, so in the summer session, it'll be Chem 142. That's it. You're the only class. Um, during the fall, it would say like Chem 142 Monday at or whatever, M M2, so this is a time and a day. All right, so those are our safety precautions. For 142 in particular, there's some additional information you need. First off, you're gonna be using centrifuges a lot. A centrifuge is basically a way of spinning something so fast that heavy things go to the bottom of a test tube. This helps you to separate solid material from aqueous. 
The newest centrifuges we have have little rubber lids that go on it. So you need to put a cork on your test tubes and the rubber lid on the top to make sure that no aerosols are getting out. In addition, whenever you use a centrifuge, it needs to be balanced. So what does that mean? So our centrifuges are um, going to, I think ours has like six spots for test tubes. You're probably not going to need that many. Um, but the blue represents an open spot, and the red represents a place where you've put a test tube with a cork in it and a label. Because if you don't label it, you're likely to mix them up. They're not going to be in the same place when they stop. So label it, cork it, then put it in. You'll notice, and say most of the time, you guys are going to be running one sample at a time. You can't put only one test tube in at a time because what will happen is it is unbalanced and it can actually break the centrifuge or it can walk the centrifuge kind of like right off the edge of the table, kind of like a washing machine when, when the, the laundry is unbalanced. So the way to prevent that is to make sure you put a test tube on the opposite side with approximately an equal weight of water. So you just kind of eyeball them. You know, if you've got this much um, chemical in your test tube that you're using for your test, then add this much water in the other one, put a cork in it, and put them both in. This is why the labeling is important. If for some reason you needed to run a bunch of samples, the trick is to make sure that they're just across from each other, like this. Okay? So with centrifuges, you need to make sure not to stop them with your hand or a pencil or any other foreign object. They need to stop on their own. So. With the new centrifuges, there are two dials, one for speed and one for um, timing. They both have to be turned in order for it to spin. So then you have to turn one or the other off in order for it to stop spinning. For the older centrifuges, um, as soon as you open the lid, it will turn off, but you have to wait for it to slow down. It takes time. Don't, if you push on the rotor, the part that spins, while it's slowing down, it it can break the centrifuge, and we only have one for each station. So if you break your centrifuge, I don't know what you're going to do. So don't. Finally, the last part is safety in terms of attire and hair. So something that's spinning that rapidly is liable to catch things. Okay, it kind of generates a little bit of um, pull because it's spinning the air around it, too. So you don't want to be leaning in and looking into your centrifuge with your hair falling down in your face. You don't want to wear a tie to lab. You don't want to have hoodie strings hanging down. Anything that dangles needs to, to be under control if you're using a centrifuge. Okay. I think that about covers it. But as always, if you have questions while you're working, ask before you do anything. See you in lab.